let's do this. There's a story that's unfolding around the world right now and it's terrifying and we need to talk about it. This is a story of greed, war, an octopus, clones and a pandemic. Not the one you're thinking of. This is the story of why bananas are about to go extinct. Their industry faces collapse, victim of the growing trade war. Major American fruit companies saw an opportunity to dominate the American banana trade. A killer trade. fungus is destroying millions of bananas and threatening the world's supply of the tasty fruit. A devastating impact in industry. The US deployed troops into the state in order to enforce the desires of these fruit companies. Bananas are believed to be the world's oldest fruit. You can find mentions of them in ancient Hindu, Greek, Sanskrit texts. Actually, the oldest mention of them goes uh, back to 5000 BC. Our story, however, starts with the first artificial cultivation of bananas by man, all the way over here in Papua New Guinea. As the fruit grew in popularity, it started being transported by merchants and conquerors all across the world. From Southeast Asia, it traveled to India, where Alexander the Great brought it to Europe, and finally carried by Spanish priests all the way over here to South America from where it spread all over across Latin America and Central America. Let's actually fast forward to 1876, when the fruit is introduced to American citizens at the Philadelphia World Fair. And to say the least, the American public went bananas for bananas. Served in many attractive ways, bananas provide high food value and nourishment. See, America's most popular tropical fruit. Seeing the enormous business potential in selling this new fruit to the American public, a new company called United Fruit Company started buying up enormous amounts of land in the Central America region and building plantations to feed the growing demand of the American public. There were, however, a couple of problems that the United Fruit Company would face. First, the banana isn't a fruit that is well suited for importing and exporting and shipping over thousands of miles. It spoils really fast, ensuring that of all the bananas that were shipped from the Caribbean to mainland US, a lot of them would spoil and the company would have to factor that into the cost, making the banana a really expensive fruit. The second problem was that at the time, there were thousands of different types of bananas that were being grown. Each came in a different shape, size, color and taste, making it impossible for the company to have one product that they could predictably market and sell to the American public. So now, you're a company that is looking to cash in on the market of a really popular new product. But that product has a huge production cost. What do you do? How do you bring down that cost? Well, for the United Fruit Company, the answer was obvious. You don't pay your workers anything. And when the local workers and people start revolting against your unfair business practices, you simply bribe a few US congressmen and influence the US government into lending you their military might. And then you take their guns and their tanks and their airplanes and you go into these countries and simply start massacring the local people until the people who remain agree to work for you for no wages, essentially turning them into slaves on their own land. I have the honor to report that the Bogota representative of the United Fruit Company told me yesterday that the total number of strikers killed by the Colombian military exceeded 1,000. And when the local governments try to step in and stop you, you team up with the CIA and plan coups and start overthrowing local governments and replacing democratically elected leaders with puppet politicians, creating what is now known as banana republics. Suddenly, you have entire countries where you can grow bananas for practically free. No wages, no land costs, no labor costs, nothing. The banana suddenly is the cheapest fruit to produce. By 1901, the United Fruit Company, because of all the backlash that they started receiving, had rebranded themselves as Chiquita Banana. Hi, Chiquita Banana. Uh, in an effort to seem more of a local exotic fruit company from Central America. Hi, Chiquita Banana. Rather than the imperialist American company that they were. I'm Chiquita Banana and I've come to say bananas have to ripen in a certain way. And while they ran fun colorful ads on American airtime, in the background, their influence grew to the point where they had become the largest landowner in Central America and their tentacles of political and military power reached almost every nook and cranny of the life of the locals there, giving them the name El Popo or the octopus. Let's actually get back to the second problem. The second problem, as you might remember, was that around the time there were hundreds of different kinds of bananas, each coming in their own shape, size, taste and colour. This problem was solved differently. For this, they turned to science. 
what they did was they crossbred different kinds of bananas to ultimately arrive at a single type of banana called the Gros Michel. Now the Gros Michel was an instant hit amongst the American public. My sticker says it's better before you bite and just one taste of my banana. It was super tasty, it was a bright yellow color and more importantly it was seedless. On the flip side, no seeds meant that the banana couldn't naturally reproduce, leading to genetic variety. You had to take a part of the banana, usually the stem, and cut it off and plant that from which grew a new identical clone of that previous banana. They essentially cloned a single Gros Michel banana. The same shape, the same size, the same taste, everything was predictable. It was almost as if it was factory made. Take a minute to really absorb this information. It's, it's so bizarre. 90% of the bananas that the world was eating at the time, they were all the same banana. They were identical clones of each other. It's no surprise then that the Gros Michel grew to become the world's first export banana. And it held on to that title until 1965 when disaster struck. Panama, Panama, disease. Panama, disease. Panama disease, a fungal disease that attacks and kills off banana plants, started from Central America and quickly spread like wildfire across the world. You see, usually when a disease spreads, it affects some members of a population more than others because of genetic variety within species. For example, some humans are more prone to having diabetes than others. But what happens when all the members of the same species are clones of each other? If there's a disease that can kill one, it can kill all of them and that's exactly what happened. Panama disease spread like wildfire across the world and it killed off the entire population of the Gros Michel bananas. The banana industry, now a multi-billion dollar industry, was in deep crisis. They started looking for other varieties of the banana which can possibly replace the Gros Michel and they kind of agreed to go with a variety of banana called the Cavendish. Now, the Cavendish was an inferior banana in terms of taste and quality, but it looked similar enough to the Gros Michel where the producers thought, you know what, no one's gonna notice. And, <laughs> yeah, it worked. People didn't notice. Almost overnight, the Gros Michel was replaced with the Cavendish banana. Of course, this time around, the companies that ran the big banana industry had learned their lesson and they decided that, okay, this time around, we won't identically clone the same banana world over just so we can import and export smoothly so that the fungal disease doesn't come back. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not how the world works. They ignored the lessons that the mass extinction of the Gros Michel had taught us and they repeated the same business practices all over again. Today, we eat the Cavendish variety of the banana. This is the Cavendish. And you go to any market, you pick up a bunch of bananas. They are all the exact same banana. They are genetically identical. And of course, like the last time, the Panama disease is back. The fungus that's now ravaging banana farms. Bananas are also facing a pandemic. It would wipe out Cavendish. And this time, it is targeting the Cavendish. So far, there is no cure. There is no prevention. There is no medicine. The Cavendish banana almost certainly will go extinct. The only thing we can do is what we did last time, is looking for other alternative varieties of bananas to eat and they might or might not look and taste the same as the Cavendish. So take a good look at the bananas that you are eating today because in a few years you might not be eating the same. All because, like other pandemics, we ignored the lessons of the previous ones. <laughs>